This is 2OF Entertainment. And we are back. Mo, Larry, and Curly. <laughs> happy New Year to everybody. Happy, happy New Year. Happy this New is Year. our first show of 2024 with you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Happy New Year. yeah. And unfortunately, everybody that I know you everybody watches the sex appeal of Vicky. Vicky is, <laughs> Vicky is sick. I'm here. He went, I'm here. <laughs> right. So the people on the podcast definitely appreciate that. The people on YouTube are watching Vicky. But anyway, Vicky is out sick. So um, she hopefully will be here next month, and she'll be in Korea next month. So that'll be fun. Um, she'll look Asian. So I want to see how that's going to play. We wish her all the best and speedy recovery to Vicky. We do, Vicky. Yeah. So anyway, Vicky, yeah. if you're watching, you get a raise if you can tell us what we just said. Um, so, but we, we, oh, we do want to touch on something because there's somebody on our show has a milestone. No, David, oh, it's not you for thank going you. all night without going to the bathroom. It is Brown Car Guy. Damn. I know. Oh, you were so close. It's uh, Brown Car Guy. He's been an automotive journalist for 35 years. Yeah. Which makes which makes him an automotive old fart. <laughs> I was going to say, I was gonna, it makes me feel very old is what I was going to say, but you beat me to it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, two, two milestones, actually, because Brown Car Guy, yeah. the brand that I created when I moved back from Dubai to the UK, has now completed five years. So in very January, nice. There is now... Oh. Five years of Brown Car Guy is completed, um, so so that's surprising. I mean, to me, it feels like I, I only just got back from Dubai, and all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, five years in, wow, what happened? Where did the time right. go? And then and then the other thing I realize is that 2024 marks my 35th year um, wow. as an automotive journalist and content creator. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I've been doing this a while. <laughs> Very nice. And the nice thing is you don't look a day over 75. So we're very happy about that. So it's very and, and, good. Um, Shazad, would you like to confirm to all your all your fans now uh, the reason why you moved back to the UK from Dubai was solely go. because of the weather? <laughs> I'd be a moron if I didn't that. <laughs> it's freezing right now outside. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, well, I'm, I'm pretty cold here, mate. So seriously, I don't know what it's been like where you are, uh, David, but over here it's been raining virtually incessantly for like yeah, weeks, for six, and weeks and weeks and weeks. I mean, literally, we've got flooding weeks. all over the UK right now. It's crazy. Yeah. And now the rain finally stopped and the temperatures dropped. So basically, now you've got yeah. black ice everywhere. You've just got frozen oh ice God. everywhere. It's just, it's just, it's just delightful. Well, if I look out, look out of my little window here in the studio, there's normally a uh, there's a waterway outside and it's now frozen. There's been minus really? five now for two days. So wow. they'll, they'll probably they'll be, yeah. And, you know, the Dutch being the Dutch, of course, uh, forget anything, you know, of any global importance, like a war in the Middle East or, <laughs> you know, the Ukraine or whatever. We had 10 minutes of them, uh, the first people who could skate this year on natural ice. <laughs> oh, my God. Right. That's, and, That's actually and, quite brilliant. The, the shocker is, of course, they could only do it until twelve o'clock, because what they've done, they have this, they have this sort of ring, which is a permanent ice, ice uh, track, and they flood it continuously, uh, to try and get at least a you know a centimeter or something of ice on it. But by twelve o'clock, so the film crew was there first thing in the morning. All these kids were out there skating, and everybody else said, "Well, it's not too bad because it's the first day we've skated this year." And at twelve o'clock, of course, it had melted. Right, but, you know, still managed to get on the six o'clock news, and the most horrendous. But the, thing, but the worrying thing is that if it melts so quickly, yeah. are then are there never any mishaps or people like? Can oh, you get rid of the kids? No, no, yeah. it would be dead because they have it. They have an iced an ice master. Who's in charge of the ice? That's that. Yeah, so, An ice Steven, uh -huh. It is an. It is it that I'm told, from the nation that still wears wooden shoes, that if okay. you are an if you are an ice my, my master master. That's a very pres. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you could say it. That's a very prestigious thing. Really. 
And Why? your job is to get your job is to get out at stupid o'clock in the morning uh, with a <laughs> pipe and make sure there's enough water on the these particular ice club rings that they have. It's like it's like it's a bit like a a, a track for a running track, but it's got um, tarmac on it with a, with a little lip on each side, and they just flood it. Well, at least you know how to make a good time out of it. That's important, isn't it? I mean, over yeah. over here, as yeah. you as you well know, David, our favorite pastime here is to moan about the weather, and I do mean moan. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Can I tell you? Anytime I've been to London, even for an extended period of time, it's always been nice. Whether it was in the winter time or the summer months, I lived in Mayfair for six months while we were doing a deal, and it was like part of it was in the winter, and the other part was like I guess oh, we're spring. Talking about, we're talking about living it's in fine. a real place, not in a bubble uh, called Mayfair. <laughs> Okay. You've been, no, you've been lucky. To be honest, I think like last year, not last year, right. when I say last year, I mean 2022, we had a very right. good summer. But uh, 2023, I think it's just rain. It's just all I remember of 2023 is just well, rain. There's, a, rain, there's rain. an English word, English word for the summer last year, and it's shite, which yeah, is basically, basically yeah. what it was. Yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. blink and you missed it. You got maybe half a day of sunshine. Wow. That was it. But but stay tuned. Stay tuned to everybody on this on this channel and the other shows because. It may well happen. It hasn't happened since 1985, but there'll be at least four hours of TV speculating about the fact that it may happen. It's called the Elfstader, and it's a race on natural ice between a, um, with a huge ring between 11 different towns connected by rivers and canals. Uh -huh. and the last time it happened in 1985, there were 400 film crews from all, the whole world because it's like a an event, right? And and it's a bit like it's a bit like when's the baby going to be born? You know, like it's going to happen. Yes, no. It's going. Yeah. Oh, look on the telephone because you, well, you get you can get an alert well, so on your telephone. You know, explain this. So, how many cities did you say? Eleven. Eleven, Eleven cities on ice. Yeah. What skates? Yeah, they're all connect. Yeah, they're all connect. I mean, you have to be. I mean, now because of climate change, people are swimming to do it. It's still, right. if you swim it, it's still, it's still one mother of a course. But it, it's a huge circle that goes through eleven different uh, wow. city, oh, towns, really, in the north of Holland. I mean, that sounds pretty epic. Let's be honest. That sounds pretty. Yeah, that. yeah it, it, so, it is. I mean, you get a medal for it, and um, yeah, you know. Cross, well, that's our society, fight. isn't it? We give you a medal for everything. So, so, <laughs> well, yeah. Congratulations, but, you, you went know. ice skating. Here's a medal. So, you yeah, know. well, you know, I mean, to, be, exactly. to be fair, Stephen, yeah, if you've ice skated that. across 11 cities, I think I know, that's, you should get a medal. Yeah. It's kind of like if <laughs> yeah. you, if you, whatchamacallit, if you like you run the New Yorker Marathon or something, yeah. they give you a medal after 26 yeah. miles. Yeah. Even if you come in like 290th, I'm still like, you should get a medal for that. It's okay. Right. Yeah. So it's, it is it, the same it, thing. It, it is a marathon. It is an ice is marathon on natural right. ice. Well, and I don't think uh, it's going to be it, covered like you think anymore because now we have um, oh, phones with cameras, it. so everybody will just watch it on their phone. Wait for it. There, wait for it. Won't, okay. There won't be. There won't. If it happens, there won't be. You won't be able to buy a hot dog anywhere. I mean, there'll be like all the cinemas will be sold out because there'll be people selling hot dogs and warm chocolate milk. Oh my God. With with cream on it. We do Milo and, instead. And, uh, and woolly hats and the whole shebang, mate. It's it'll be a big business thing. Yeah. There you go. And it bores bores me to tears. <laughs> okay. You, well, you've just been talking about it for ten minutes. Yeah, I just talked about it for the last twenty five <laughs> minutes. Half the audience fell asleep, and the people that are in their cars listening to the podcast probably crashed into a tree by now. So they're like, this is really <laughs> boom. So we're probably going to get sued. Thanks a lot. They crashed so, into a frozen lake and just, they crashed into a frozen lake. <laughs> I'm just warning you what will happen. You know, if it's uh, yeah, it'll just, you know, if it does, it'll go it's global. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. It won't happen. It's fine. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> we'll keep keep our fingers crossed. Global warming and that little let's call yeah. that little Dutch girl. That yeah. it's getting warmer and warmer, warmer anyway. This we supposedly had the warmest uh, year on record uh, this year or 2023 in the UK. So, According uh, to the Economist this morning and the New York Times, so 2023 was the warmest on record globally for the planet and we did, and we went 1.5 c up so now there's no turning back it's the end of the world thank god uh, i'm with the illuminati and the lizard people as everybody knows we just can't wait so everyone dies by 2027 this is awesome <laughs> so 
We're keeping our fingers crossed. Speed up the process a little bit. Keep a good. Might as well. Might as well yeah. go out yeah. with a smile. There you go. <laughs> you you can't. Smile. It's like we're not doing anything to make it better. So you know, we'll see what but happens. Because this, but because this is all you know about an illustrious uh, old old fart of a journalist who talks about cars, yeah, yeah, yeah. we really should be going. We sh we sh I should be trying to bridge into this next segment. And there you go. Well done. What has changed in the last thirty-five years? Oh, I mean, in the automotive world, it's incredible. I mean, the cars, I mean, this is without even talking about electric cars, because everybody right. thinks electric cars are the messiah, you know, and they're going to basically solve everything, which is not entirely I am true. your messiah. Sorry. No, electric cars, electric cars. Electric cars, David, electric cars. David, I, didn't, I didn't say that. But uh, <laughs> aside from that, when you just think about cars on their own, I mean, when you talk about 35 years, I mean, I think, I think it's fair to say in the last, within the last 15 years, or maybe even a little bit more, our job as motoring journalists has become much, much harder because it was quite, well, I would say it was relatively easy in the past to say, that is a really good car. That car is okay. And that's a pile of shit. You could say that, you know, because you could very easily, easily distinguish between these cars. Even when I was in Dubai and it must have been maybe 2008, 2009, something like that, the first Chinese cars came into the UAE. And my deputy editor booked a car in, so we got it into the office. And um, I said, okay, let me, let, me, let me take it around the block. You know, for academic reasons, I should go and experience it and see what it's like. You know, it's the first Chinese car in the market. Can't remember what brand it was, but anyway. So he, get, he tossed me the keys. I went down to the car park. I unlocked it. I opened the door. The door felt like it was going to come off in my hand. You know, the interior <laughs> was terrible. Literally, the seats were sort of, you know, the, 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 the material was already kind of peeling off it. It was, it, I just closed the door, went upstairs. I said, no, I don't think I'll bother. You know, that's, right. that's how bad it was. I, said, I don't even want to do that, you know. Fast forward to, you know, what, maybe 15 yeah. years later, and they're making some of the best cars around, yeah. honestly. I mean, the, the quality of cars coming out of China is just second to none. So, A, it's just the progress in terms of an entire industry where there is literally, like, it, it, it was, people used to say this, but now it's absolutely true to say there is no such thing as a bad car anymore. There just isn't. You know, Except the Tesla. Except Tesla. I mean, Let's just get yeah. and their Cybertruck. Yeah. It's a, rel it's a relative <laughs> term, you know. It's like you know, I'm Renaults. I'm not a fan of Tesla because no. I feel it's that Teslas choice. are still um, they're concept cars. They're not cars that have been finished properly. But having right. said that, there are a lot of people that absolutely adore them. They've got yep. cult following. There are people that you yeah. can't say anything bad about them because they'll just jump on you, you know, straight away. Yeah. So that so there's a lot and there's a lot of technology that's coming through in things like the Teslas. Um, so the cars are all very very good. The emissions, we talked about climate and we talked about global warming. Cars are now cleaner and better than they've ever been. You know, they're right. also they're safer because of the crash safety cells, the structure on the cars. I mean, people say, oh, they don't make them like they used to. And you think, well, actually, that's a good thing because, you know, you die in an old car if you crashed. Nowadays, the likelihood is that you probably won't, you know. But the and good thing, if I may, with an old car, if you owned a 1950, 1960 or 1970 something car and, and you died, all they did was hose it down and sell it to somebody else because the car yeah. was still intact. So the it was a, there's a, there's a pro and a con. There's a pro and a con to if it's better or not, you know. Your car got into an accident. You were dead, but the car was still sellable and you were good to go. So, you know. You just, you just, be, you just, just be cut out it in half, panels, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yep. cut it in half. Oh, you've got there a frontal. Go. I've got, I've got one that's been crashed at the back. Hey, what they used, what they used to call, uh, what they used to call a cut and shut. The cut and shut is what yeah. they used to call them. They would just join yeah. two cars together, you know, two good bits and just join it together. But, yeah. but now you have the safety cage, and people are like, oh, I just, I was in a minor crash and my car just disintegrated, and you go, yeah. well, actually, yeah, it's meant to do that. That's that's right. how they're designed now. They're designed to disintegrate around the crash safety cell so that they absorb all of the the force of the impact. So they're, they're better, they're safer, they're cleaner, the emission standards. The irony is that diesel, diesel car sales have literally plummeted through the ground right now. And mm -hmm. the crazy thing is about the latest Euro 6 standard diesels, they essentially clean the air. So the stuff coming oh, wow. out of the tailpipe is actually cleaner than the stuff going in because they've got filtration systems. Yeah. So the irony is that we all hate diesels now, but diesels have actually got better than they've ever been. But wow. That, so that so the crazy thing is that actually cars are cleaner, they're safer, they're better, they are just and they're getting better as well. Today um, I just posted a story up on Motor Easy and uh, dot com. I write for them, and they'd asked me to do an article about uh, whether we're going to see AI in cars. And we'd obviously, right. you know, Stephen and I had been talking a lot about Chat GTP and stuff like that. 
And so I looked into whether this was coming and it seemed to me like it was coming. And I submitted the article yesterday. I sent it off and then I checked my newsfeed and Volkswagen announced yesterday that they were introducing chat GTP into their cars by the second yeah. quarter of this year. So then I had to quickly revise it and send them a second copy and say, mm -hmm. look, don't use the first one, use this one because it's, this has already happened. But I think this more of that's going to happen. And I think that cars right now, they just the technology is just getting better and better. Yeah. The downside, you and just to sum up, the downside of what you said in 35 years, the excitement, the visceral excitement and the engagement of driving a car, yeah. I have to confess, is a bit less now, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I just made a video looking back at 2023, and of course, I drove a fair number of brand new cars in 2023, and, and I said, and I asked myself a question in the video, but what was the best car that I drove all year? And it was a car that I was driving, which was my classic 1989 BMW. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just because the feel, the sensation, you know, the engagement that you get with the older cars is something that's sadly missing in newer ones. Even the, even well, and I know we're not going to we're two more minutes on cars and then we're done because we have other things. But yeah. even the supercars, like I'm, I was looking at one, it's very nice. But the and and for what it is, the engine note was okay. It was all right in general. And then my friend said, "Drive my Marcia Largo." And I did. And I'm like, now this is a supercar. Yeah. Um, this is a car. Yeah. Like, I, all right, this is a supercar to me. Not yeah. like the new stuff is gorgeous and it's all, yeah. it has all the toys and like literally can do everything. But I'm just like, but I don't feel the road. I don't do, I, I want to, I want to be part of the car. So, and the other the thing about the cars, Murcia Lago yeah. is, that, and especially if you drove like the SV Murcia Lago, it's a car that's out to get you. Yes. It's, a car, it's a car that's out to kill you, basically. That's yeah. that, that, that car, when they say it's a bull, I mean, the, all the Lamborghinis obviously are named after fighting bulls. And it's right. very appropriate because those cars are yeah. rocking, bucking, crazy, yep. wild beasts. And they're out to get you. Because I remember driving the Murtilago uh, SV around the Dubai Autodrome, and I thought I was going to die. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I thought, I thought, well, you know, what a way to go. That's what I yeah, so if you're going to go, go in a naturally aspirated, you know, 800 horsepower, 12 cylinder. <laughs> Italian beauty. And exactly. really funny is that's the only car from them that doesn't break. I mean, the newer ones, I don't break, but no, I mean, like, no, you know, no, they don't break. The newer cars don't break, but the classic right. ones, even, even the Murti Lago, like I think at Diablo famously, somebody, a gear lever just came off in the hand. And yeah. stuff like yeah. that, you know? So that used to happen, but the Murti Lago was such an experience and, you know, and you drove around the autodrome and I thought this is going to kill me. And he said, one more lap. And I said, hell yeah. Let's yeah, yeah. Let's just, one more. <laughs> let's see what happens. I drove it and I was like, I, and it was at gated six, right? And I'm like in heaven. He goes, don't buy an automatic because yeah. the automatics break. He says, the gated six will, la will last you the, your life. And I'm like, really? So I'm, yeah. I'm, that's my vacillation right now. It's like, and now, you and super car that. I think a manual Lamborghini at all. You can't, you can't buy them. You can't all. get them anymore. Yeah, all the new ones are, are all push a button. They're all automatic. And, I think and there's something the weird about that. Well, you know, and there's other things that have happened. So like when, when we were, I, I think fair to say, when all three of us were growing up and we right. looked at supercars, whether it would be, you know, a Lamborghini Miura or a Ferrari 250 GTO or even a Countach, if you actually ever saw one, which to be yeah. honest was very unlikely, you know, in that time it was very unlikely that you see right. one. Whereas today I could go down to Kensington, I'd probably see four or five supercars straight away, yeah. no problem. But at that time it was genuinely unlikely that you'd see one. If you yeah. saw one, you'd lose it. You'd yep. completely lose it. And not only that, but you'd want to know who was driving it because he would have to be some kind of, and, and, I, and I am, I'm being chauvinistic. I am saying he, you know, yep. it would have to be a he. It would be a Superman of some kind. It would right. be a celebrity. It'd be something because you'd be like, oh, dude, that man, yep. look at, he's, he's cool, you know. And I know that it's sexist and everything, but that was the, that was the perception. That was the reality yep. of it, you know. If you did see a woman driving a supercar, you'd completely lose it and then lose it again. It was, that would be yeah. a, another thing. But in, invariably, it would be a man. But of course, nowadays, you know, influencers and teenagers are all driving around yeah. in supercars. Yeah, it's so, not. It doesn't have the luster it used yeah. to have. Um, and a lot of them. I was speaking to someone. And there's some car group here, and I was speaking to one of the guys, and he has a car, and I was saying, "So tell me about your car." Like if I'm going to have a supercar, I will know every detail. Like I'll yeah. know how many screws. Right. And I, and he's like, you know, it's this. And I'm like, right. What yeah. else you got for me? He knows nothing. It's just yeah. I'm, in my mind. I'm like, so poser, small dick syndrome. Got it. I'm like, there's, and I remember growing up uh, good, bad or indifferent. My father's friend had the 250. He had a Testarossa and he had a 512. Wow. Um, and I was like, and I got, as I got older, I got to drive them and they were just like, I was like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing. Yeah. Um, but when I would go to Palm Beach, 
with my family. Seeing all those cars, we, we were like, oh my God. In Palm Beach, you would see them every day. It's like they were all parked on the street. It was like no big deal, kind of like it today. And then if I went to Beverly Hills for something, same thing. But if you lived in like Miami didn't have them as much. New York City didn't. Malcolm Forbes, I think, was the only one with a Countach, you know, back in the day. So it was very different. And now, you know, we're in Austin, so we're not like a car anything here, right? But you see tons of cars, and I'm just like, oh, there's a Lamborghini. There's this. There's that. Yeah, okay. I mean, it doesn't – they don't excite – and I don't think the designs excite me anymore. There's just something – they just to me, they're pushing them out, and I really want to see a car – that I, that's why I think I like the older cars that you go yeah. back maybe from like, if you will, the fifties into like maybe the late eighties. I like those because I think they have, a, they have personality. Now I look at them and I'm like, well, that car looks like such and such from 1975. This car look so to me it's sort of like unless the modern stuff is great, but I'm kind of like, I like the old stuff. I like that. I like the notes. I want to hear the notes when I start. I want to vum vum and go, oh, good vum vum. Yeah. You know, not whatever. Ah, what do I know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. now so, talking so about that, you, how. I just, go ahead, want, I, so I just want to ask one question, uh, uh, you know, to finish up this segment. But, yeah. um, uh, argument in house, Polestar. Is it really a Volvo or is it really just a Chinese clone? I oh, know it's a Volvo. It is a Volvo. It Polestar a Volvo. was always a Volvo brand, um, as you know. And in fact, Polestar for a while was actually, you know, like BMW have the M Sport brand and yeah, right. Mercedes has the AMG brand. So um, for, for Volvo, Polestar was supposed to be that brand. It was supposed right. to be the sporting version of, uh, of Volvo. And then, of course, a few years ago when Volvo nearly disappeared, let's be honest, like Saab, it nearly went you know, the way of the dodo until the Chinese bought it. And, but what the Chinese have done very cleverly with some of the brands, such as Volvo, such as Lotus. I mean, this is Geely. Geely owns both Volvo and Lotus. And the good thing about the way that Geely or Geely, however you want to pronounce it, how they operate is zero interference. They just go up to them and they go, here is a stack load of money. Do what you do, but now you've got the money to do it. You know, that's what they do. And this is why you've seen the resurgence of Volvo. And this is why you've seen the resurgence of Lotus. And this is why Lotus is suddenly coming out with all these EVs. Um, and the only thing with Polestar is they said they must have made some sort of deal. It's like, okay, well, we want to have manufacturing in China. And so they said, well, we're going to move part of Volvo there. But all the engineering and all the design and everything is still happening at Volvo. Yeah. So the Polestar is... That's, that's, that's a real contender against uh, Tesla's here. As yeah, well, and so to be honest, it's a better car, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would say it's, the Polestar... Because Volvo, I mean, again, the thing about... The problem I have with Tesla is it's an upstart company. And it doesn't have these, the, I could almost say for a lot of these brands, a century of experience. You know, when you talk about Fords and GMs and, you know, all of these big brands, Toyotas or what have you, they, we're talking about 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years plus, you know, in some cases, you know. And they have all of that experience. They have these massive R&D departments. We talk about Tesla. The Tesla just Tesla is basically they designed the car on the whim of Elon Musk. The, the Tesla, the the cyber, the, what's it called? The Cybertruck, right? What's it cyber called? truck, right? Yeah. The the that that was basically Elon Musk going, oh, I like the Esprit. Make a truck that looks like an Esprit, and that's it. <laughs> I mean, that's like somebody drawing on the back of an envelope and saying, make this. So yeah. it, well, it looks it looks like somebody. We said that the other day. It looks like somebody. You'd, Sitting in a dark room with, with a box of crayons, didn't it? And it just, uh, I mean, the only, to be honest, to be fair, like the only, the only thing that I, I can relate to when it comes to Elon Musk is that he is a huge fan of the Lotus Esprit. In fact, I think he's got the Lotus Esprit that was in the Bond movie. He's actually got it. So okay. he's a massive fan of that. And that's why in Tesla, I believe that in the in car entertainment system, there is a, vol there is a Lotus mode in there, isn't there? And the Lotus is in some of them. When you go through the different modes, you'll see okay. a Lotus come up, you know. So, so that's and that's why the first Tesla Roadster was also based on uh, a Lotus right. Elite. Okay. So, so there is that connection there. But yeah, the reality with Tesla is that I think that they do a lot of their development. They, they basically they put it out to market and they do beta testing in market. That's what they do, and then they <laughs> then they fix things right. Whereas man, whereas established car manufacturers can't afford to do that because then they just right. get sued left, right, and center. So they have to make yeah. sure that their cars are fit for purpose before they put them out there. Mm -hmm. And and you can feel the quality difference straight away. Like you get into yeah. a Tesla. The only problem I had with Tesla is every time I get into a Tesla, it feels like a Fisher Price product. You know what I mean? It feels okay. like yeah. it still feels like a bit toy like. It's not yeah. quite there or, yet. Or an, old, or an old DeLorean when you get one. Oh, uh, I like the DeLorean. An old DeLorean will feel yeah. good, you know, because yeah. it, it, I mean, uh, what was his name? John DeLorean that built yeah. it. He came from the American car industry. General and Motors. 
from General Motors, and then he combined with Lotus in the UK. Lotus basically mm -hmm. developed that car. So the underpinnings of the DeLorean is actually a Lotus Esprit. The, uh, it has the same uh, single backbone uh, uh, four type suspend, uh, chassis on it that the Lotus has. It has the same setup. Just the engine was moved to the back rather than in the mid, uh, mid, mid rear. So it's essentially a Lotus. So there was a lot of engineering, a lot of expertise that went into that car. A friend of mine had one in Dubai, and, and he actually used to drive it quite regularly. And it was yeah. brilliant. You know, well, it had a Volvo engine. So it's never going to, back then, Volvo made a real engine. It was, you know, when you talk about 88, what was it, 88 miles an hour I had to get up to? Yeah. That was like, that was an ask. That yeah. was. That was an ask, but it had the Volvo engine, which you knew back then when Volvo made an engine, it was going to last 5 million miles yeah. and it was a stainless steel body. So in theory, the only thing that would go crappy in, in a DeLorean would be the leather. Yeah. And now I know that in um, somewhere here in Texas, DeLorean's trying to have a resurgence. They're trying to debut a new car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. So better left it. Let's hope they don't use the the same bolt company as as Boeing. Then that's all we can say. <laughs> <laughs> Before that, let's we're well, gonna get because cars is brown car guys thing. We just yeah. wanted to wish you happy thirty five years and got off on a tangent. So we apologize. Now tell us about your book. How's the book going? It's going yeah. well. It's going well. It's been. It's. Uh, I just had um, yesterday one of the guys, a guy called Paul Cowland who okay, works cool. on uh, Salvage Hunter, Classic Cars TV series. Right. And oh, uh, he, he posted up. That. Yeah, he, and, he put, and he posted up on his Instagram yesterday that, you know, it's, it's, he's posted a picture of the book and gone, this is nice. really So I was like, okay, well, cool. <laughs> well, we're going to do one better than that. We're going to run the advert. That's oh, right. Cool. Let's do it. In London streets, where politics and power collide, the Ulez Files by Brown Car Guy is a thrilling new novel depicting a high-stakes battle for the roads. Join Max Turner, a motoring journalist, as he uncovers a plot to control car ownership and personal liberties. With agent Eleanor Rodriguez and tech genius Flux Jackson, they race against time through London's iconic streets. It's a narrative that questions the balance between environmental policies and individual rights. For fans of cars, action, and political intrigue, the U.S. Files promises high-speed chases, tactical ingenuity, and a fight for justice. Available now, exclusively on Amazon.com. The U.S. Files by Brown Car Guy. Get your copy today. Brown Car Guy. And there you go. There you yeah. go. I was able to use um, Dal E. The, the, yeah, Dolly on chat. I use it too. It's awesome. To 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 create visualizations of of these characters for right. um, for this novel, which is what you saw in the ad there. And um, the crazy thing was that it got you know I kept putting in I kept putting in descriptions until I got got it to refine it to a point where they looked pretty much like the characters I imagined, and it was right. kind of creepy. You know, one thing I didn't realize about uh, writing a book was what an intense process it is <laughs> and how much you kind of end up you you kind of you sort of end up in that world somehow so your right. daydreaming moments your sleeping moments you know i started to dream about these characters i mean honestly it, you really kind of become obsessed with that world that you created which is you know it's complete fantasy i mean the book obviously is called ulez files it's based in london it's around the theme of the war on the motorists and the ultra low emission zone but it's fiction it's set three right. years in the future and it is fiction. So all the characters are not, they're not the real people or anything like that. They're entirely fictional characters. But I, I, that's one thing that I have to say that as, as a first time author of something of that length, it took me by surprise. It's just how hmm. much you get involved in it and how much it kind of, it sort of takes over your life. It's incredible. That's cool. Now, so has it been selling like hotcakes on Amazon and like people have reviewed well, it? What do they say? Uh, no, the reviews have been good. Uh, I think good? it's on yes. points or something on Amazon. So that's quite good. So thank you to everybody that's done that. Uh, how is it selling? I don't know. I've been afraid to look, to be honest with okay. you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm just keeping fingers crossed, you know, and see how it goes. But the reality is somebody said to me, is like, oh, you know, you're going to make your millions out of a book. I said, I don't think I'll even break even. Do you know what I mean? And even though it's a self-published book, but the reality of it is that you know the, the, you don't actually sell that many, and and it's it's really hard because when you think about the motivation that you need to do a project like this, um, that was his agent sending yeah. a check. Yeah, that's time, yes. time, time to write another book. It's so. like uh, movie, movie deals in the bag. There you go. 
<laughs> that would be great. Exclusive. But, uh, but you know, the, that's the thing that as a as a as a freelancer, this is what I do. I'm a freelancer. Yes, I have brown car guy, and that's a content that I create. But for 35 years, I've either worked at a publication or I've freelanced. And at the moment, for the last five years, I've been freelancing. Freelancing, you get a commission, you do the work, you hit the deadline, you get paid. You know, so right. you know that like that's a job. That's kind of like that's what it, how it works. You know, and I guess this is one of the reasons why I haven't really written a book until now, as we've discussed in a previous podcast that I had tried several times and I just kind of ran out of steam. And right. that's because you don't set yourself a deadline. So what I had done this year was I or last year rather, I had set myself a deadline. So I basically, and it was actually, and to be fair, it was off the one of the shows that we did, and we talked about novels, and and right. they, you guys were really encouraging me, and I was like. God damn it. Okay, I'm going to do it. And I had actually set myself a deadline. I said, before Christmas, I'm going to get this out. I don't care. Stephen, does that mean we're going to get paid as well? Is that what he's trying I'm to hoping that in, I'm hoping in the forward, he gives us a thank you. But I haven't seen the book yet, so I don't know. So, like, I want to thank two old parts for pushing you to do this. I'm going to make it. Yeah, sure. But, uh, but, but, but so I thought, okay, you know, I'm just set a deadline and I'm just going to do it. But, but the reality of it is, is that that's five that was about five months of my life right. that went into yep. this you know and you go that's a lot of work you know and what do you what are you going to get that's out a very of sexist it? remark to make you know because uh, babies are nine months you have to give to other people <laughs> have, have more effort here come on not five months I, I, I don't know actually come to think of it it is a bit like because if you're talking about giving birth to all those characters that's it's true almost, yeah. it's yeah, almost it's almost <laughs> yeah but see, it helps though that you're actually a writer. Like, if I was going to write painful, a book, I, I would have to actually write it and then put it into ChatGPT and say add things like periods, commas, paragraphs. You know, things that you apparently need when you write. So it'd be a little different. Like, so it's and also I don't. It was like three or four hundred pages. You have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, as yeah. Michael Eisner would say. Right? You have to have a first act, a second act, and then the final third act. Yeah. So to do that as well is very cool because you have to tie it in. It just can't be a bunch of stuff. So the fact that you did that, kudos. And this is well, this is the other thing that I, I learned this time because previously I would just embark on it. Right. I would just embark on it. I'd be like, okay, this is an idea. I've got a loose idea. I've got a loose idea where it might go, and I'm just going to start writing. Right. And I'd get to like chapter three and four and run out of steam, you know. Gotcha. But what happened this time was that I said, okay, no, I do. I take a different approach entirely. I said, okay, I just arbitrarily decided it was going to have thirteen chapters. Okay. And then, and then I created you know, kind of pages for each of those chapters. And I started populating those pages with notes. Okay. So basically, what I then ended up with was the plotting each chapter independently, and then linking them together. And, you, okay. and that way, you could also put in certain cliffhangers and stuff like that between chapters. So right. that way, before I even started writing, I actually pretty much knew who the characters were, what they were doing, and where they were going and how they were going to get there. So I, I, can, I just, I, can I just interject here and just say that, ladies and gentlemen, this is Shazad uh, teeing us all up for book number two and for all the publishers. He wants to take at least a year off to, uh, <laughs> blueprint, to blueprint, blueprint his next book and then take yeah. another year after that to write it. Basically, and, to make, yeah. and to make the movie. Yeah, so, so if somebody could just advance me two years worth of living costs, then that would be great. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, and make, and make the movie. Isn't that crazy? That's what people say. You know, I have to. I can't, it takes me two years to write a book, exactly because well, of what you're to saying. Be honest, you're like... I, I mean, to be honest, like I said, I mean, I'm being. Uh, it probably took me five months. So, and, right. and out of the five months, the writing process was probably four months, and okay. one month was basically just thinking about it and planning it and just writing down notes yeah. and stuff. And so, so I did all of that process of plotting out the thirteen chapters, and then, and then I did all my research as well at that point. Um, regarding places, locations, and stuff like that. Going to locations in London where I was going to set it, you know, so there's a sequence that happens on the Uber boat that rides along the Thames. So I took a day and I did that. Then I went, you know, to the, to the various locations that were in the book just so that I could double check what I was already thinking that could happen. And there right. were a couple of things where I realized, oh, that doesn't work. That idea doesn't work because physically it couldn't happen, you know. So right, right. There, were, there were things like that. But I would say, so it was a month of doing that. And then the okay. rest, I did all of that first so that it wouldn't interrupt the writing process. So that I could just then so write. So what's the next one then? Uh, traffic jams in Tahiti? David, it goes back to that motivation thing, doesn't it? Because it's a case of like, you know, is there the well, motivation? You don't, feel mo you don't feel motivated to go to Tahiti and write a book about traffic jams? 
Oh, absolutely. If somebody's paying me for it, I'd say there you go, right? I'd eat you all day long. But, <laughs> but, but you know, you got you know, guys got to eat. You know, man's got to eat. You know, so you go. Go. he's got kids. He's got two kids and a wife. They out there. Yeah, they're hungry. Two they, kids and a wife. They, 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 they got grown kids, man. You know how much they eat. That's true, and you just can't get rid of them. So, and and I've seen his daughter do the TikToks and or the Instagrams that make fun of her dad. So, you know, you got to support really? this. My goodness. Now, his son is a beanpole. I don't think he does eat. So he's probably, yeah. you know, he's okay. But the daughter, a lot of energy. Like every time I see her on Instagram with with her dad, I'm just like, no wonder your dad's tired all the time. You're, you're killing the poor guy. Yeah, stop. And his son's very chill. His son's like, I'm, I'm making a video. Leave me alone. He's, he's and a- that's it. Uh, he's very laid back. He is, he is. There you go. But the daughter, no, no, she could come on one of our shows, and she has more energy than all of us. So yeah, yeah she's, she's just. She's quite funny, actually. She's when she's a, when she's you know, you know, like young people, they have moods, right? They have moods, right, right. you know. But when she's up, she's hilarious. She's really, right. really funny. And then other times, she's just being a teenager, you know, moping around. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, that's what that's what duct tape in the closets for. But yeah. <laughs> apparently, that's frowned upon in some countries. So let me get this straight. So you you did a month of research, wink wink, um, and you got so basically you took a ride on the Thames and you yeah. went around London. Yeah. So you were a tourist, and you're gonna write that off on your taxes. Got it? Okay. Yeah. So damn. <laughs> I'm I'm saying, saying, that. Oh my god! Yeah, theoretically, you were you basically you, everything you spent you money on year. was to do research, right? So yeah, all that is considered year. work, huh? Yeah. So if you take a yeah. year off, she's yeah. gonna, oh and your publisher will pay for you to you know go around and and, and research everything, yeah. yeah, to Tahiti, and um and you can write that all off as expenses against the key, writing the, the key, book. The key word you used there, David, was publisher. <laughs> 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 Well, yes. there, there's he's, there's he's, the rub. There's to use a Shakespearean term. There's the rub. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that's what the stop. noise was on your telephone. It's all those publishers now. You know, just thinking, <laughs> where is he? Where is he? Get yeah, inside. We need him now. I wish. I wish. Yeah. No, I mean to be fair. I mean, I could have. You know, if you'd gone down the publisher route, I mean, I could have done that. I could have spent another yeah. year, you know, sending it off to various publishers and and being rejected over and over again. But right. two things. A I don't think I could have put up with, the, with all those rejections. I thought, you know, that's just not right. good for the ego. So scrap that. And B, I also thought because I'm calling it the ULES files, there was a certain topicality to it. There's a certain, I think, time right. duration yeah. to it. And I thought if I leave, the, I, I thought this is something that has to be done now. And if, it, right. if it's left a year or something, then by that time, it, it's old news, you know. So um, so I, well, it had to be t- done now. So I thought self published Tahiti files, you know, that'll be that Tahiti, well, forever, Tahiti's right? always there, so that's not a problem. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and the traffic jams are always there too, so it works out well. So well, really, they, they do. They say write about what you know, and this is one of the reasons why I did the ULES thing was because, right. well, I after spending most of the year covering the ULES story and covering the the marches and the demonstrations right. and interviews and analyzing the whole thing, my head was full of it. So I was like, okay, let me let me just use that because I'm right. already there. And and the previous novel that I'd started but never finished was actually based in Dubai because again, write about what you know. So I was like, right. okay, let me, let, it was based around a road race in Dubai. I mean, that might still I could always go back to that because that's I think I still think that was a great idea. So you never know. It's great, except the traffic in Dubai. There's never going to be a road race there because it took for us to get to the Palm Island to downtown to the the whatever the mall. Yeah, plaza t- took us like an hour and that's only like three kilometers because the traffic now in dubai is the worst so the only way you're having a road race is it may be at 3 30 in the morning and you get that half hour when no one's on the road so yeah, but yeah, yeah. but yeah it's, but, it's, but don't forget them in most cases 20 minutes or 30 minutes you're out of dubai and then you've got uh, empty roads when we went to Abu Dhabi from Dubai, our driver was like, I can't wait. We made two right turns and then we're on the highway. And he's like, nobody there. I'm like, love it. And, you know, he's just doing like 100 like it's nothing. And he's like, look, there's going to be a high-speed rail here. I'm like, yeah. could you just pay attention to the road, please, and not point things out there? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's something new. That wasn't there before. But the uh, Emirates. Emirates is uh, yeah. going to do a high-speed rail from, I think it was, he told me, Dubai, Abu Dhabi to Riyadh. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, and he was showing me the terminals are built. And they're starting now to build the actual rail. The, the Riyadh leg, I don't know how they're going to do because obviously there's a border crossing there. And yeah. Saudi borders traditionally have been quite difficult, but I think they've opened it up a lot these days. So I think it's a lot easier. MBS. MBS is... I'm assuming, I, yeah. I'm assuming they'll probably do the, the border control checks before you go on the train, maybe, so that yeah. they could... Just or it'll stop at, at Abu Dhabi and then you'll do everything you yeah. need and it goes to the next or however they're going to do it. But yeah, I mean, MBS is opening up because of the city neon. 
yeah. he needs everybody yeah. to come. So you, it's either you're going to go the way of the 23rd century or you're going to go be, back to the 15th century, and the 15th century is not going to work you out know, for you. As you guys know, I used I grew up in Saudi Arabia. So in yeah. the 80s, we lived in Jeddah. And to think, and I haven't been back since. I've been back once, actually, to be fair. I went back once. I went to Riyadh to check out the right. Riyadh uh, circuit that was there, the motor racing circuit. But uh, but I haven't really been back to Jeddah since then. And when I hear about all this stuff that's going on in Saudi Arabia now, I am absolutely astonished. I, I, I could never have imagined. I had run-ins with the religious police when I was there. In, in, in wow. The and it, that's how strict it was. In, sorry, in, in Saudi Arabia. That's how strict it was. That's how, you know, it was, it was very controlled. I mean, we couldn't even go to other cities. Wow. So if we, if we wanted to go to another city... Uh, my dad would have to get permission from his employer, so we'd have to have a letter to say that we were allowed to go to another city. Wow. That's how much. That's how controlled that place was. So all these places that are now coming out, where there's all these arch, you know, historical monuments and sand carvings and all this stuff. Yeah. When we were living there, we didn't know about them because they never publicized them, and you wouldn't be able to go there anyway. So right, now, right. the way that this is now opened up, I mean, I'm just absolutely staggered by it. I'm absolutely blown away by it. And um, but I'm also a little bit worried because I'm also thinking that. It's a traditionally very conservative country, right. and there's a massive population there. And there was an entire and so in, when I used to be there at that time, there was a tussle between the the, the royalty, the monarchy, which is essentially the government, and right. the religious police, because the religious police were almost as powerful as the government were. It, it was right. how crazy it was. What they've done now to subdue them or to 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 reduce their powers, I'm not sure how they've done that. But what right. I fear is uh, if I can just use the metaphor of a pressure kettle. You know what I mean? It's just to me, it feels like, you know, I, I just worry that, th that that entire sentiment or that entire breed of sternness and strictness couldn't have just completely dissipated. It must, it might still be there. And I'm a little bit concerned about how far they're pushing with things like uh, Neom and, and the, because they're making an entertainment city there, aren't they? Yep, but it's also far enough away from uh, any of the other cities that you probably can yeah. get away with it. So I think yeah. that's maybe how they're doing it. And I think also I mean, just, MBS... I mean, just a few, sorry to interrupt you, Stephen, but just literally only about six, seven years ago when I was still in Dubai, right. there was a thing that went viral. There was a kid. It was a Saudi kid, a good tubby right. guy. And he was just having the time of his life. He had, he had his Walkman in. He had his, not Walkman, whatever they call them now. Right. Whatever. He had that. He was crossing a road and he was just boogieing across the road. Because he was just enjoying himself. Right. Yeah, absolutely innocent, you know. And he, and he got arrested for that. And wow. That, that, was just, that was just like when I was still back in, in Dubai. So that must have been like six, seven years ago that happened, you know. Wow. And you just think that's appalling. And I think like he was, you know, whatever. But it, it was, I mean, you think, and so now they've gone from that to having yeah. an entertainment city. And I'm like, okay, if it was Dubai, I'd completely understand. Because Dubai has right. been rocking the world since several decades now. No problem. Dubai right. actually, when I moved to Dubai in 2006... I was very surprised because my previous experience of the Middle East was Saudi Arabia and right. knowing how strict it was and how conservative it was. When I went to Dubai, I thought that it would be similar. And I, when I got to Dubai, I was like, hey, this is just like UK, but a bit hotter. And I was yeah. like, that's it. You know, you, you've got everything here. You know, there are pubs and everything. This is just what it's like. And I'm like, okay, completely different. But Saudi Arabia, I, it, it's one to watch, definitely. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, I think the fact that the city is going to be far enough away from the main cities, it's in the middle of nowhere. I yeah. think that's one and two. MBS realizes that you know you have oil, you have this, you have that, but you better get some other stuff going on. So I think he's the one because he seems to rule uh, Saudi with an iron fist. Yeah. So I'm assuming that he's told the religious police, "Listen, enough. Like yeah. women are driving now. I know, and there's other yeah. things. So like, unless they do something that's terrible, whatever. I don't know what that would be. Then yes. If not, I think they're very much like we need to get into this at least come up a couple centuries. Then from the yeah. third century. Because if yeah. not, we're not going to be anything. And yeah. they can't afford it in a world now that is literally changing this quick with technology that if you don't do it, you're, I think you're screwed. And I think he realizes that. So that's a positive. I think for the young people there, it's probably a positive. I think older people that are still set in, and I mean this not in any bad way, but just the third century mindset, it's a bad thing for them. But I think they're just going to, everyone will just like in Dubai, right? You have people that are still in the third century and you have people that are in this century and they live together and nobody seems to have a problem with it. And they all respect each other. So, and I'm assuming that's what will end up happening in Saudi Arabia. 
You know, it's yeah. incredible and how... It, and that's, of course, you're a journalist, in which case... Uh, hey, uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and this is the thing. You know, I started my career. So we talk about 35 years of motoring journalism. I started my right. career in Saudi Arabia in 1989. And one of the things I very quickly learned was uh, when I was doing reviews of cars or articles there, is that right. you started on a positive and you ended on a, on a positive. Okay. And you, and, you, and you basically, you hid the negative between the lines. Got you know, it. Because you didn't, because otherwise you'd be like, yeah. you'd be out of the country. Like the door, you know? Yeah, the door fell off, but it was a door. You know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so so, so I, I, you, you, even my very early career, I learned how to write diplomatically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because you had to. But the thing was, like I said, between, people that read the articles, if they read it all the way through and they read between the lines, they, they got right. what I was saying. But you yeah. started on a positive and you ended on a positive. That was the way to, to, to live, to survive. That's how you did it. But, and nowadays, everyone just says what they feel. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, which is good, though. That's how it should be. But, but, but still, in some parts of the world, you can't right. do that. You, you, you still right. can't do that. Although, like, in other ways, I mean, if you, if you look now... Last night, we were watching um, a show. It was a documentary from uh, what is now called Mumbai and before it was okay. called Mumbai in India. And uh, it was basically showing the lifestyle of the elite in India, right? So there was fashion houses and, and these billionaires like uh, Ambani and Sangrani and all these people, you know. And it culminated in a party and all this sort of stuff, you know. And when you look at the stuff that's happened in India and in Pakistan, to be fair, right. When, when you look at the generation, like you look at my dad's generation and our generation who have been here in the UK for like two generations plus now sort of thing. Right. Um, there's an interesting um, uh, fragmentation of um, ethics and morality between what's here and what's there. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is the people that came over here, so in the 60s, 50s, even 70s, they brought these sets of, of, of conservatism, of moralities, of the ways that, of, the, of living and stuff like that, and they maintain them. So even though we're here in the UK, to a large extent, they maintain that way of behavior, those ways of you know, what, what was perceived to be correct morality and what have you. But what's happened in India and Pakistan is they've moved on. <laughs> yeah, the century. So the right. reality is that like even when we're sitting here, when we look at what's when we do documentaries about what's going on over there, and you just go, right. <laughs> you just shocked because you're like, oh my god, that that's okay there now. Oh, you can do that now. It's just it's just a completely different world. Right. Whereas over here, we're still thinking about how it used to be 20, 30 years ago. And I mm. guess with Saudi Arabia, I probably still have that mindset because I still think of Saudi Arabia as what the place it was when I grew up there in the eighties. So. Right. But the world moves on, and it's, it's it's staggeringly quick sometimes. And yeah, and it can only get quicker and more crazy. I think in twenty twenty four, yeah, that'll be definitely. interesting to see. That, that's so, no, no. So I think next show, because we're running out of time on this show, we were going to talk about the UFO monster in oh, Miami yes. Beach, but we won't have time. So well, that's the cliffhanger for next show. We'll talk about the UFO monster in Miami. It's a really quick thing: is there was an eight or ten foot monster apparently running around. Um, one of the uh, Bay Sharer Mall, apparently 61,000 people didn't have power. They had Black Hawk helicopters and they closed the Miami International Airport. Um, and it and big, big news. And Fake apparently news. there's video of this Fake thing. News. Uh, big news, whatever. Um, and they have that. And everyone's been talking about it. And they, all of a sudden, all the security cameras all over the mall apparently went out. And they can't show video. The police cameras that the police had confiscated. They said it was four teenagers fighting. And so one of the people that live across the street in the high rise is filming it. And he has a picture of this monster that he posted on the internet. So people are like, if there were four kids fighting or even gangs fighting, you know, they would be showing this on television, right? Yeah. So everybody's like, boom. So somebody said they heard one of the kids said that they developed a portal and they opened the portal and then this monster came out. So whether Whoa. it's true or not, don't, don't know, but we'll discuss that on next in February. Stranger things. I know, right? And then... And, and by the way, quick, well, quick kudos yeah. for the box of nerds on your shelf at the back there. You got my Thank you very much. I'm like, wow. There you go. My box <laughs> of nerds. And all my scotch from my nice scotch people that I have to actually start drinking. So, yeah. but uh, yes. Yeah, that, was, so that, was whole... a gift, that was a gift from Saudi Arabia. 
<laughs> that, that's, that's right. They, they confiscated all the scotch and sent it to me. Thank God. So, so yeah, so next show we are going to talk about that because I'm assuming more news will come out. It'll be old news, but for us it'll be interesting because it'll be good to get everybody's perspective on that. Yeah, like I said, yeah. today we ran out of time, so we can't do that. So, that But it's always good. No, 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 listen, I, I, love, I love our dialogues. We can go off on whatever tangent we decide. It's always good. So, well, always a pleasure to see you. Happy New Year once again. Happy New Year to everybody that's watching Brown Car Guy for the first guy, the Sermon on the German. Um, he'll be go back in February. Buy the book. Buy the book. Buy the book. Buy the book and read it and let us know if he's thanked two old farts making noises for helping him move his tuchus. I don't think so. Um, I'm assuming that'll come in the second book. Um, traffic Jam yeah, in Tahiti. So, traffic oh, Jam in oh, Tahiti. Yeah. That's right. yeah. I wonder if but we I even think, mentioned. I think David has to write the forward for the second book. Traffic that's Jam. right. I think David should write the forward for the second book. It'd be nice. John, and you know, John. David, you know what we'll do? Maybe we can write, you know how they put those reviews on the back? Like I read the book and it's so wonderful. Yeah. We should write yeah. the review for his next book and it'll just sign two old farts making noises. Maybe then we'll get a copy, but I don't want to say anything. Um, so <laughs> one day we're going to get it. We're going to read the book. You will. You will. I'm one getting day. some shipped in soon. Yeah. I, you know, I'm just busting your chops. Anyway, always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Don't miss Brown Car Guy on YouTube. I'm Brown Car Guy, um, and you can see all his car reviews. You can see all the stuff that he does. It's totally phenomenal. Um, and once again, congratulations on 35 years in the automotive industry. That is a milestone, and congratulations, five years as um, yeah. Brown Car Guy on YouTube. Don't miss Brown yeah. Car Guy. David? I wasn't gonna say I wasn't gonna say brown old fart, but there you go. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for helping us out now. <laughs> thanks for waking up.